Hello everybody. Greetings once again from Chennai, the southern part of India. Today I'll briefly talk about the stormy journey of an old drug, thalidomide. Thalidomide is a synthetic glutamic acid. It was first introduced in 1956 as contigran and touted as a very safe antiemetic and hypnotic, especially for pregnant women. Patients loved it because not only did it stop the morning sickness, but it gave them a restful sleep at nights without the hangover in the morning. Five years later, 61, in a letter to Lancet, William McBride, an Australian obstetrician, informed the editor that he was seeing a significant number of phocomelia, that is limb deformities, amongst infants born to mothers who had been taking thalidomide during their pregnancies. Soon case reports came pouring in from all parts of the world. So the drug thalidomide was then condemned as one of the great medical disasters and banned by the medical community. But in 1965, Sheskin, a leprologist, found quite serendipitously that when he had administered thalidomide to the leprosy patients for its hypnotic effect, the painful tender nodules of erythema nodosum lepros, all of them subsided without having to resort to systemic steroids. So in 1988, the FDA approved of its use for erythema nodosum leprosum. Following its success in treating ENA, dermatologists started using the drug off-label in other difficult-to-treat dermatoses. Now, before I talk about these various uh, dermatoses, a few words about the pharmacology of the drug. Thalidomide would not be out of place. Thalidomide can be taken before or after meals. It is absorbed very slowly from the gut and reaches peak levels in about two to six hours time. The mechanism of action? It is hypnosedative mainly. Secondly, it is an immunomodulatory drug which inhibits TNF-alpha, reduces helper T cells and suppresses interleukin-12. All these play an important role in CMI. Humoral immunity is also affected. And thirdly, it has a direct effect on neural tissue and it is also anti-angiogenic. So, such a wide repertoire of activity, the drug has enabled clinicians to try it in disparate conditions. Since the treatment has to be prolonged, one should be aware of the putative side effects. The most important side effect, of course, is its putative teratogenesis. Hence, women in their childbearing years should be very careful about starting the drug. The other common side effect is peripheral neuropathy manifesting as painful paresthesias of the hands and feet and lower limb sensory loss and muscle weakness. The muscle weakness recovers once you stop the drug but the sensory loss remains. So how do we monitor for these side effects? Nerve conduction studies Usual full blood counts with platelets and hepatic transaminases could be done once in a few months time. So we'll just consider a few of the diseases where thalidomide has been found to be very useful. As I mentioned earlier, ENL, it was a prime indicator for the use of thalidomide. It's known as erythema nodosum leprosum. The reaction pattern of ENL can occur spontaneously or it can follow an anti-leprosy treatment in highly baciliferous patients. It consists of sudden onset of red nodules, more on the face and extremities. The nodules are painful and tender and are associated with systemic signs and symptoms along with uveitis, acute neuritis, iritis and superficial lymphadenopathy. The most severe forms where the patient looks toxic, systemic steroids may be needed. In such cases, thalidomide is a boon to avoid the serious side effects of long-term high-dose steroid therapy. ENL is the only 
FDA approved indication for thalidomide therapy since 1988. Second, Bechet's disease, described uh, nearly a century ago by the Turkish dermatologist Hulusi Bechet. The cause of the strange disease is not known. Many treatment modalities have been tried, but none totally satisfactory. Thalidomide causes quick resolution of the painful orogenital ulcers. Thirdly, condition called prurigo nodularis. This is an extremely pruritic condition of unknown etiology. Thalidomide, especially if it is combined with narrowband ultraviolet light, has given very good satisfactory relief from the symptomatology in these patients. Fourth is uremic pruritus. Nearly 80% of patients on hemodialysis complain of troublesome itching. Thalidomide 100 mg daily for 7 days is very helpful in breaking the itch scratch itch cycle. Lastly, subcutaneous paniculitic T cell lymphoma. This is a rare form of cutaneous lymphoma characterized by subcutaneous nodules usually on the upper and lower extremities. There is no epidermal involvement in this type of lymphoma as opposed to the other forms of T cell lymphoma which are epidermotropic. The conventional treatment is chemotherapy by medical oncologists. We had two middle-aged women with a proven SCPTL, but both of whom refused to have chemotherapy when they were told by the oncologists that they will be losing their hairs. So they requested us for some alternative line of therapy. Since thalidomide had by then been in use for the treatment of uh, multiple myeloma, we wanted to try this drug with uh, the written consent of the two patients. Both of them did very well. Within a few weeks' time, the nodules subsided, the fever and other systemic signs abated, and we were able to withdraw the drug in three to four months' time. And we have followed up these two cases for eight years with no sign of relapse. This could be yet another indication for thalidomide therapy. There are many more conditions where thalidomide has been found to be effective and certainly a better option than high-dose long-term steroid therapy. So, a drug which was condemned in the 1960s is today found to be of therapeutic excellence in many unrelated clinical scenarios. Let's therefore not forget the admonition by that great uh, English author, poet, Alexander Pope, who said, Be not the first by whom the new is tried, nor yet be the last to lay aside the old, for old may be gold. Thank you.